morning. It's the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, and it's July 12th, 2020. Uh, welcome to Guilford Community Church. You'll see that I'm not in my normal stole today. Today, I and many others around the nation are wearing black in solidarity with our brown brothers and sisters um, who are making a silent protest today for systemic change in our society. So we join with them and are happy to do that. This said, our service today also will reflect in part on the issues which are tormenting our nation right at this time. Nonetheless, we know that many of you come with your own trials and tribulations. Um, and so we ask that you enjoy this service as well. Uh, we try to have prayers for all and everyone who needs prayers at this time. So please recall the UCC uh, slogan, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We also hope that if you're not um, in regular contact through our e-notices, um, that you give our secretary a call at 257-0994. She can put you on our list. That will keep you up to date. We have two notices each week on Wednesday and Friday. Um, and we'd love to keep you in touch with me and with others in the church. I'd also like to note as we uh, start uh, our announcements uh, that we, it'd be good to have a candle ready. We have a time of candle lighting in a few minutes. But for now, we have announcements uh, from our transition committee. First, from Fred Brunig, our moderator. Good morning. Uh, the transition committee, uh, which consists of Dunham Rally, um, Patrice Murray, Sue Owings, Tom Yonner, Connie Green, Lucy Sparblase, myself, plus Lisa and Elisa, uh, met last week to uh, continue planning for the overlap in September. Elisa reported on her progress regarding housing. Their house is now officially on the market and they have already had a number of showings. They're also working with a Brattleboro area realtor to find a new home in our area. The, if you happen to hear about a house that's about to come on the market, uh, contact Connie Green, who is acting as the point person for any leads. Uh, Lisa, Lisa reported that uh, she will be cleaning out her office later this month so that it can be painted and so that uh, a new armoire can be installed, that armoire created by Dwayne Johnson, a beautiful piece of uh, work of art, I should say. Uh, August plans include a celebration of Lisa following her last worship service on August 23rd. Uh, note that August 30th is a union service led by Center Congregational Church. Assuming cooperation by the coronavirus, uh, we will have an outdoor party with instrumental music and berry shortcakes. Numbers in attendance will be managed by having everyone having an assigned time slot to come. We will be wearing masks and plan to social distance and, and there's fortunately no real hugs. In September, to help uh, Elisa transition to our worship service format, uh, members of the transition committee will be helping with the recording and logistics so to um, so that she can get up to speed. She's been um, doing worship services live on Sunday mornings. More details will follow as we get closer to September. The full committee, full transition committee will meet again in early August and the August celebration subcommittee, which also includes Mary Paluski, will be meeting again this week. That's all for now. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me or any other member of the Transition Committee, and we will keep you updated via the e-news, as well as announcements like this. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. And now Lucy has some word about uh, some festivities that will be coming down the pike in August. Hi, my name is Lucy Sparblase. I'm on the committee that is planning to celebrate and say goodbye to our wonderful pastor, Lisa Sparrow. We have several dates in mind in August. Monday, August 3rd, 
from 9 to 10.30 a.m. Wednesday, August 12th, from 12 to 1.30 p.m. And Friday, August 21st, from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Please watch for a postcard for more information. We'll also have a larger celebration on August 23rd, which is a Sunday afternoon. More details will be available later on. Um, if anybody would like to help in any way, please call Patty at the office or email her. The office number is 257-0994. Thank you very much. So a few weeks back, um, I invited Josh Davis to speak to us about all the news at Groundworks. Um, there is a lot of news. So he's here with us for about five minutes today. And if you're interested, we can invite him for a Zoom uh, question and answer later in the month. And then after that, uh, you'll be hearing from the Harnishes a more personal thank you to everyone who's contributed to our meal teams um, this year. So here's Josh. Thank you for having me here and letting me uh, give a quick update on where we are. I know that this community is so invested in the work that we do as Groundworks, uh, both being a fan from afar, but also actively participating in the work that we do. And so first and foremost, I wanna say thank you to the meal teams. And I wanna say thank you to Rob and Jill Harnish for their work in spearheading that effort. It's hugely impactful that we're able to provide a meal for the folks that are in the motels and it makes a huge difference to their experience. And so thank you for being a part of that. I'm pleased to report that we will have some uh, changes coming up soon that will help bolster our meals in the motels. And there's a program that we're piloting here in Brattleboro called Everybody Eats, which is funds that will come to local restaurants to make meals for the community. And folks that are staying in the motels are part of that. And so we'll be able to access that. And we're hoping that it goes so well that funds continue for that program. But right now that's being uh, earmarked as a, a pilot program. So we'll keep you posted on how that's going and the impact that that is making. But that's something that you should hear about because it's a, another wonderful example of a cross-sector collaboration. If you think about the people that are involved at service providers, as well as folks that are in restaurants, as well as some of the business development folks that are helping to spearhead that process. So that's really exciting. I think largely the question that I'm getting a lot right now is what's going to happen to folks in motels? Like, what is that looking like? And I can give you a snapshot of what we're seeing today. Um, as with COVID, it just underscores the uncertainty that is a normal fact of life, but has all been highlighted the more through COVID. And we're still experiencing that. It's really uncertain about where we're going, but we have a vision and kind of a direction that we're seeing through the fog. And so if I could paint that for you just quickly. Right now, the state uh, is supporting about 90 eight adults in the Brattleboro area and seven children. These are uh, figures that I was looking at uh, from yesterday. So still a significant number of people that are using uh, the motels as shelter. And in the short term, we are engaging more with them. At first, when COVID came through, it's really just about getting people into a room and keeping them safe. And now our focus is shifting to, can we start getting people out of the motels? underscoring that we have a really low vacancy rate in this community. So it's always a challenge to get people into housing, much less, you know, we have 100 people who are looking for housing all at the same time, not to mention the broader community. But we're going through that. We're doing uh, assessments on folks to establish housing need so that we can address those needs and get people connected to the resources that they need to get back into housing. The state also understands that this is not going to be a quick process, so they're able to access corona relief funds to provide motels until the end of the year is what it's looking like. So even though we're, they're committing in two-week chunks, uh, behind the scenes, they're committing to Groundworks providing services until the end of the calendar year. And so that feels like a very positive development that we can kind of relax in that fact and do our work uh, supporting people getting back into housing. At the same time as part of uh, the Corona Relief Fund, CRF funds is in the shorthand, is that there was about $23 million that was allocated for capital expenditures throughout the state uh, to bring more units of housing online. Because we do have a, a vacancy issue, very low vacancy rate, there's a lot of competition for the housing units that are available. 
the state wants to know, are there ways that we can quickly bring more units of housing online? And locally, we've looked at motels as providing that, that opportunity. And through a process where uh, the Housing Trust and, and Groundwork supporting their efforts have vetted a number of properties, uh, they put in a letter of interest with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, who's kind of holding these funds and will distribute them to the community. Uh, the Housing Trust put in an, a letter of interest for Dalem Chalet. And the idea there would be that the housing trust would purchase that property, renovate that property, and we would use that as what is being dubbed temporary permanent supportive housing. Temporary in the sense of years, not months, that this housing would be used with a, a mainstream lease so that when somebody comes in, it is their unit. Uh, but temporary in the sense that we also understand that motels are not always in their current form the best for long term housing. And so working on a plan to while this program is going on, also add housing and units of housing to our community at large. So temporary in the sense of the next five to seven years is what we're talking about the scope of this project. So it's incredibly exciting that we're able to add units to our community to get people the housing that they need. There's also a couple other things that the state is funding in an effort to uh, find more available units in our community. And one of those is upgrades to apartments that are either online now or just offline and need uh, some repairs to get them in compliance with code. And so that funding is, is coming out uh, in the next couple of weeks. We also have funding that's gonna go toward back rent for people who have been uh, negatively impacted by COVID, loss of uh, income, unemployment, who are behind in their rent to help catch them up so we're not adding to the people that are experiencing homelessness right now. Additionally, we're working really closely, as I said, developing a housing plan with everybody in a mo motel. And there's some funds that are coming to our community that will be extremely flexible, that will tie into somebody's housing plan that will allow them uh, to get into a housing opportunity, uh, but for the funds they need. And so I'm really excited that we'll have a big pot of flexible funding that people will be able to access. So kind of three different pathways that the uh, state has allocated funds for and we're working really closely with our partners to make sure that those uh, funds go where they need to be and we're getting people out of motels and into housing as much as possible. Thank you for being a part of that, supporting our efforts. And I look forward to coming back at some point uh, and doing a question and answer. You know, in the backdrop of all of this, I was, in the congregation not too long ago talking about this vision around uh, the new drop-in center or and also a home for the overflow shelter that's been floating in the community for the last couple of years uh, so if you haven't driven by south main please do uh, 60 south main you can see the progress that is being made there on a daily basis it is fantastic the foundation of the new building is emerging from the ground and we'll be framing that building next week so even in spite of everything that's going on existentially in our world, we're still able to move forward with this program on 60 South Main. And I know that many in this congregation are a part of that. And I wanna thank you for your dedicated support to the work that we do. Much gratitude. I would like to take this time to thank everybody for all the support uh, through these troubled, troubled and hard times. Um, every time we came to the congregation for support, uh, you guys exceeded our expectations um, so much that when we were approached to help out on unscheduled dates that we had the funds and were able to buy pizza on two different occasions. And um, as you can imagine, buying pizza for 50 to 70 people was quite expensive. And we, we had the resources to do that. So that's, that's quite amazing. And uh, I also like to thank, uh, I like to thank Jill personally. Uh, she did not want to, she wanted to take a year off. She's been doing this for a long time. And um, she, uh, she came to my side and was able to really help us and push us through. So I'd like to thank you personally for that. Thank you. <laughs> and I'd I like to take time to thank some other people that are always there to help us. And I'm, I'm sure I'm going to forget some. And if I do, please forgive me. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Pat and Jim Haynes, uh, Rob and Amy Noyes, uh, Lucy. She always, always prepares food. Um, Januska, she's a huge help. Don't forget Tammy. Oh, Tammy, yeah, Tammy's great. She's always there, always willing to give money and 
and come down and cook. Um, Jan, Sandy, Joellen, and Jonathan. There's just – the whole congregation really makes this job um, – I don't want to say easy, but it, it definitely makes it easier. And uh, really, just thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rob and Joe, for all you've done for us. And now to honor you, we have a song, My Heart is Ready, uh, done by Peter and Mary Alice, uh, along with some photos. So we hope maybe during this time, as we prepare for worship, you would light your candles. My heart is ready and what am I gonna do? My heart is ready and what am I gonna do? My heart is ready, what am I gonna do? Oh God, my heart is ready and what am I gonna do? My feet are ready and what am I gonna do? My feet are ready and what am I gonna do? My feet are ready, what am I gonna do? Oh God, my feet are ready and what am I gonna do? My voice is ready and what am I gonna do? My voice is ready and what am I gonna do? My voice is ready and what am I gonna do? Oh God, my voice is ready and what am I gonna do? My hands are ready and what am I gonna do? My hands are ready and what am I gonna do? My hands are ready and what am I gonna do? Oh God, my hands are ready and what am I gonna do? My spirit's ready and what am I gonna do? My spirit's ready and what am I gonna do? My spirit's ready and what am I gonna do? Oh God, my spirit's ready and what am I gonna do? My heart is ready and what am I gonna do? My heart is ready and what am I gonna do? My heart is ready and what am I gonna do? Oh God, my heart is ready and what am I gonna do? Thank you for the beautiful music. All right, now I'm going to lead you in the call to worship. If you have your program, uh, please follow along. I'd also like to mention uh, that if you don't have access to programs, our deacons are happy to drop them off for you. So just let Patty know. Thanks so much. All right, and here we are, call to worship. Our Mother, Father, God has made us to be one body with many members to share our diverse gifts, act divided by one and the same spirit. God longs for us to be united in love and to manifest the spirit in our different ways. Let us gather in this hour to offer praise and worship to our holy God who challenges us and calls us to create the beloved community. And now let us uh, say together our prayer of confession. Let us pray. O oh God, we long to co-create with you the beloved community which looks to the common good and privileges all equally, creates societal systems that celebrate the humanity and gifts of all. And yet we focus on our differences. We envy each other's gifts. We devalue manifestations of you, O oh God, that are not like our own. Perhaps our sin is a slow wait for justice. We allow the voices of brothers and sisters who do not look like us, love like us, or worship like us to be silenced. We have told them to wait for freedom, wait for justice, wait for equality. We foster in them, as Martin Luther King says, a denigrating sense of nobodiness. Lord, have mercy upon us. Or perhaps we have kept silence ourselves in the face of their struggle for full human life. For it is not solely hateful words and actions, but also appalling silence that follows the path of oppression. Christ, have mercy. Perhaps our sin is to give in to weariness, discouragement, bitterness. You have called us, as Martin Luther King says, to be drum majors for justice, peace, and righteousness. Yet the work of peace and justice overwhelms us at times. To build with 
God, the beloved community seems impossible and we grow weary. We cry, peace, peace. But there is no peace within us or around us. We find ourselves on the path of hatred and oppression, violence and injustice. Lord, have mercy. All right, I would now like to encourage you to meditate by singing um, the opening hymn, which is called Gate of Sweet Nectar. It's really a chant, and it might it's a nice way in this kind of difficult meditation to just carry yourself into a time of silence. So we will sing the opening hymn, we'll have some time of silence, and then I'll read the assurance. So here is this beautiful music. Please join. Calling now to hungry hearts Thank you. Sisters and brothers, God is at work in us and with us. God has promised, I will not keep silent and I will not rest until the vindication of my beloved people shines out like the dawn and their salvation like a burning torch. My people shall no more be termed forsaken and their land shall no more be termed desolate. We remember that you have given your beloved people a new name, and that is, my delight is in them. Thank you, God, for delighting in us even now, for forgiving us our slow action, our silence and our weariness, for empowering our work, and for inviting us once again to create with you the beloved community. And now we have our virtual choir singing Somebody's Knocking at My Door. And you're welcome to sing along. Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Whoa, sinners, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinners, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Knocks like Jesus. Somebody's knocking at your door. Knocks like Jesus. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinners, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Can't you hear him? Somebody's knocking at your door. Can't you hear him? Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinners, why 
why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Jesus calls you. Somebody's knocking at your door. Jesus calls you. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Thank you. And now, will the children please come forward? So, good morning. This is the children's story for July 12th and Remember last week we talked about blindness and healing the blind man. This time we're going to talk about a different kind of blindness. Um, and I wanted to start by sharing with the congregation the story that we learned this week about the turtle and the spider. And you've been helping me remember it. So as we remember it, spider was very greedy. He didn't like to share, right? And Turtle came to visit, and it's hard for Turtle to even go anywhere because he's kind of slow, so he knocks at the door, and there's this huge table full of food, right? And, and Spider said, come in, right? And then they're just about to eat, and Spider said, I don't know about you, but where I live, we never eat with our hands dirty. Right. So he said, we never eat with our hands dirty. So Turtle said, oh, of course. And he waddled down very slowly, because turtles are slow, mm -hmm. to the creek, washed his hands, and made his way back. And by the time he got there... His hands were dirty because the way up. Right, and the food was half gone. So he looked at his hands. He went back down. He washed his hands. He came back up. And by the time he got up the next time... The food, was, the food was gone. So that was pretty tricky. A spider. And pretty selfish. So Turtle said, well, that's okay. How about you come to dinner at my house? Right? And then the tables were turned. So when Spider was so excited, he didn't even have to buy his own food. He was going to go to dinner at his friend's house. Yum, yum, yum. He got there and he realized that Turtle eats underwater. So Spider tried. And can you imagine what happens if a spider tries to go underwater? He just floats back out. He just floats because spiders are so little. So he went back out. He got a jacket. He put on a lot of stones in those pockets. And sure enough, when he got in, he sunk to the bottom. And there was all the food. And But the turtle said, I don't know about you, but... I come from... We don't wear jackets at the table. Right. And so Spider took off his jacket and then... He bounced up to the top of the water and he could never eat any of the food. So they were sort of even. But they were both also, they didn't get to eat with each other. So I wanted to talk about that because in that story, it's a different kind of blindness. The spider was blind to, um, to, the, to the fact that Turtle couldn't walk without getting his hands dirty, right? And he also could, was blind to the fact that Turtle really probably needed some food too, right? So he didn't see it. So what do you think would have been a cure for blindness in both cases? For the, for the turtle who was really mad and so he made it possible. So well, what's a cure? Maybe you should teach him to be nice and like, the Wait. turtle should teach him, well, we have to be nice and share. And share. And share. So what share. might have been a solution, no just a practical solution for that poor turtle and the dirty and the dirty hands? What could Spider have done so that turtle could actually have washed his hands without getting his feet dirty? Uh, the spider, spider could go the sink. Oh. Could have just given him a little bowl of water to wash his hands in. That would have been easy, but he made it really hard, didn't he? So, because he was greedy. He was greedy, but he, he was also blind to his friend. and He was blind to what he could have done to help, because he was just looking at what he needed. What about the turtle? The turtle was so mad, and so he was blind, too, a little bit, because he was, you know how sometimes you just can't see what you could do to help somebody because you're mad at that person? So what could he have done if he... 
he he ate Rhea under the water. Is there any way he could have made it possible for Spider to have some food? Keep his jacket on. He could have kept his jacket on. That's a lot. Or, let him, or let, like, maybe he could put his jacket on his face and tie it to the chair so the chair is heavy. Oh, yeah. So there are a lot of creative ways where they could both have shared with each other. But and they, they, didn't. Said they didn't. They didn't. Turtle was nice, but she was like, well, he wasn't nice to me, so I can't be nice back to him. Yeah, it started a whole thing of not being nice to each other. And then neither of them got to eat with each other. That was sad. Yeah. So <clears throat> why don't we pray a little bit? Because I think there are a lot of things in the world where we could share, we could think of another way to do something that would be nicer, and we just don't, just because we don't. Right? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Uh, <clears throat> blessed Lord, we know that we can all be like spider and turtle, that we want to have friends and we want to share meals, but we just are blind to how we can not be selfish. So help us think in those situations. Open our eyes to what we might do so that everybody has enough. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Just a note before the next anthem, uh, now that we've said the children's prayer, uh, last week uh, Janushka sent us a copy of what's called the Abolitionist Hymn, which is an alternative version of My Country Tis of Thee that was written in 1843. And we've included here in the anthem, which is to follow, some of the original words, and we've also updated it a bit for today uh, as preparing us to think about what it truly means to be an abolitionist. So here we go. My country tears of the stronghold of slavery of the I sing land where my fathers died where humans rights derived from Side by deeds shall reign. My native country, the where all men were born free, if white their skin. I love thy hills and dales, thy mounts and pleasant vales, but hate thy neighbor's sails as foul as now comes the Douglas voice, abolitionist rejoice, hearts filled with hope. Emancipation came, many worked hard for gain, Jim Crow knocked it all down again with a hundred years. Rosa Parks took her space, children marched in our place, black voices heard. King's words inspired us all, equality was the call, now confederate generals fall, the nation stirred. Kaepernick took the knee, systemic slavery surely will fall. Protests still show us how our work's just starting now. Let us all take a vow to heed the call. Welcome the joy.
Thank you, choir. And now we have Jen McCauley reading our contemporary reading by Ralph Ellison and our scripture for the day. Here she is. The contemporary reading is from Ralph Ellison's novel, Juneteenth. And who can blame those who don't feel that they have to worry about the complicated truths we have to struggle with? In this country, men can be born and live well and die without ever having to feel much of what makes their ease possible, just because so much is buried under all of this black and white mess that in their ignorance, some folks accept it as a natural condition. But then again, maybe they just feel that the whole earth would blow up even if a handful of folks got digging into it. It would even seem a shame to expose it, to have it known that so much has been built on top of such a shaky foundation. But look, this is here and now, and the stuff has begin, begun to bubble. The man who fell and the man lying there on the bed is the child, Bliss. That's the mystery. How did he become the child of that babyhood, father to the man as it goes? And how could he have been my child, nephew and grandchild and brother in Christ as he grew? The confounding mystery of it has to be struggled with, and I wish it was all a lie and that we could go back home and forget it. The scripture reading is from Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 to 34. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, an Aramean of Paran Aram, sister of the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. He granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If this is to be the way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. The two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. What abuse is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to them and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. May God add a blessing to this reading. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. O oh, blessed Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I keep thinking of an experience I had in Walgreens a couple of weeks ago. As you may know, I have recently had trouble with my knee and I found myself um, for some other reason picking up something at the drugstore. And then I noticed that there was a whole end cap display devoted to knee and leg issues. <laughs> Who knew? Braces and solves and painkillers and vitamins, a whole world of possibilities I hadn't even known were options. I was very familiar with the hospice department, the end of care, uh, things that they have there at the store with the baby needs, with allergy medicines, and with vitamins, but a whole department worth of cures for my knee it was just amazing. Of course, it reminded me of the many cures and possibilities that we've been offered in recent weeks and months by politicians and protesters offering cures for racial injustice overturn the justice system, improve education, increase housing and social services, violent and nonviolent cures for a struggle as old as time. 
So I decided uh, earlier this week to research the history of abolitionism in America, only to find that abolitionism be was developed years, centuries, thousands and thousands of years ago, as early as six centuries BC in Athens. Not that it didn't continue to have slaves, but at least they had made that proclamation. France and Italy banned slaves in medieval times to do away with serfdom. And as early as 1500, the Pope banned the Spanish from making slaves of indigenous people. In 1777, independent Vermont, not yet a state, became the first place in North America to prohibit slavery. Slaves were not directly freed, but masters were required to remove slaves from Vermont. No slaves allowed here. In the 18th century, Thomas Jefferson himself, a longtime slaveholder, and some of his contemporaries had plans, 174 words, in fact, uh, which abolished slavery as part of the Declaration of Independence. But just two days before the 4th of July, representatives from the South insisted upon removing it at the last minute. Many have wondered how our whole country might have been different had the 174 words abolishing slavery been removed. Benjamin Franklin, also a slaveholder for most of his life, was a leading member of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society the first recognized organization for abolitionists in the United States. Our scripture for today then, and much of the Old Testament has much in common with our national history. Two brothers, fraternal twins, the famous Jacob and Esau, tangle in the womb and once born for per outside the womb for parental love, they tangle just as importantly, to be the one who holds the birthright, the inheritor of the property. It's hard to miss the parallel between systemic racism and the biblical system, which gives everything to the brother who either inherits, inherits it or snatches it. These two are prophesied to be fathers of two nations, two tribes, if you will, and they do come to coexist but never to reconcile. It is deceit at the heart of this story which makes it so heartbreaking. Brother cheating brother, and for what? Jacob ultimately has to escape anyway after his deceit and remains estranged from his homeland, from his father, from his mother for 20 years. And Esau remains tethered, tethered to his father, a virtual slave until the end of his life. We are left to wonder whether it was all worth it anyway. Ralph Ellison's last novel, which is called Juneteenth, uh, catches another complicated aspect of our country's racial identity issues. The passage that Jen read just a minute ago catches a black jazz musician uh, whose name is Alonzo Hickman. Uh, he has long been a revivalist preacher, and he is now in this scene sitting at the bedside, pondering the fact that a young white boy who he adopted at a young age, who he raised and who participated in the life of his church, has now become a bigoted politician, famous for race baiting. To make things even more complicated in the story, the young Bliss, that's the name of the boy, was shot in front of their eyes by a black assassin. So Hickman loves this bigoted white man as a son and is both amazed and puzzled to see him use the tricks he himself uses as a preacher in effective racist politicizing. Then the story rolls on and we find the complexity of his fatherly love for this child set against the child's betrayal 
he that's mixed up with his despair at the death of this son. But it also means that he no longer trusts God as much. If so much has come to pass, which has brought him so much tragedy out of something which was originally love. This book helps us understand how complicated it will be, and this is what Ralph Ellison was doing, to become a truly multiracial society with set when there are secondary issues like poverty and violence that are mixed in. How grandiose ideals can cut, somehow come to seem foolish and so solutions are hard to find. This is a reverie that Ralph Ellison offers us. So back to abolitionism in America. There's that same complexity that Ralph Ellison found. Long before the Civil War, some had called for an immediate end to slavery, and failing that, concluded that the separation of North and South probably made the most sense. Moderates, on the other hand, believed that slavery should be phased out gradually in order to ensure the economy of the Southern states um, not collapsing. Then, of course, there were the more extreme figures like John Brown, who believed an armed rebellion of enslaved people in the South was the quickest route to end human bondage in the United States. And we know how that worked out. I like to say and that Congregationalists were early voices for abolition. They quoted scripture often, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. They helped with the Underground Railroad. They saved um, slaves who had escaped, but all the while many kept servants who lived in poverty, almost in slave conditions. The following century, Christian soldiers came home and filled churches in the 20th century, but they stood by speechless when the black men and women they had fought beside in World War II were denied the GI Bill while they went on to college and to life-changing education and training. The civil rights marches were successful to some degree, but they happened on the backs of people of color, while white allies rarely risk their lives. Where, I have asked myself these past few weeks, is the part of our Christian repertoire that will open the doors to equality? And I realize that that's the question indeed. I realize this is a spiritual malaise related not so much even to racism, because what is racism? Does race even exist? As much as the core selfishness that we were born with. Jacob and Esau, early sons of Abraham, were tainted with this fragrance of greed. Esau, believing he was more deserving. Jacob, using his wiles to steal from his own brother. And why? At least in part, because it was a no-win situation. Like the abolitionists, they had three very bad choices. They could live separately. They could trust that over time they could adjust the balance of power, which was unlikely. Or they could outright fight with each other. And during their lives, Jacob and Esau did all three. But that didn't change the fact of the birthright law. All along, it was the birthright rule itself, just as systemic racism exists in our nation, that was and is the problem. The assumption for them was that there would not be enough for both of, that both of their families, that they were not wise enough or generous enough to share what they had with one another, or that they were creative, or that there were creative ways to make things work. Then, just as now, there was a system of patriarchy which set women and men and 
women and children and slaves aside and set up brother against brother. Whether it was Cain and Abel or Joseph and his brothers, the Bible allows us to see clearly the lose-lose situation which has been humanity's heritage under patriarchy and which stayed that way until Jesus came and gathered a band of men together with women working side by side, together sharing and serving each other and the poor, until he turned over the tables of the moneylenders, until he shamed the Pharisees and the Sadducees, until he stood up to the politicians and the criminal justice system, until he proposed an entirely new kingdom of heaven on earth, until And that kingdom would be under God with compassion and responsibility for all. The truth is that racial injustice is no good for anyone's soul. And the cure does not lie in politics or in education or criminalization, but rather in the realm of the spirit, where there is nothing to lose and everything to gain by turning things upside down and walking side by side, if nothing else, the COVID virus has taught us we are in this world together. Let us pray. O Lord, give us strength to walk your walk and talk your talk, to create systems of solidarity and kindness, of healing and repair, Let this be our faithful walk with you and all our brothers and sisters on this home we call Earth. Amen. Thank you for that anthem. Now we have Tom and Nancy Regal leading us in the prayers of the people. We hope you can you can find the prayers and join along. Thank you. Let us pray. Blessed Mother, Father God, the ancestors surrounding us at this time are increasing rapidly. Millions of loved ones having died of the COVID virus. Angels and cherubim, who were once black children and teenagers, mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers dying in the streets, in hospitals and homes, are mounting a holy choir to sing of transformation and freedom. Bless and protect the people, black and white and brown together, protesting in the streets. 
Help us each mount our own movements of love and compassion, of courage and commitment. Soothing the wounds of prejudice and hatred. Providing the tools for healing and cure. Giving all we can to the hungry and homeless. Pondering what justice might look like in prisons and courthouses. Supporting our children to live out their visions. Protecting our elders so they may live out their days in health and comfort. Opening our hearts and homeland as safe harbor for immigrants and refugees. Remembering we live with untold blessings. Conscious we have privileges others do not. Mindful of the power we have to foment change. Embracing the possibility that you place what we need within our hearts, within our church, within our community, and within our nation. Acknowledging the gifts of the earth and other nations. And holding Christ's vision of a world lived in love and care. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now again, it's time for me to thank you for the offerings that you continue to give. It makes such a difference to us and to the church to be financially stable at this time. I did also want to mention <clears throat> on behalf of the Interfaith Youth Group that for safety reasons, we've stopped collecting uh, bottles on our back porch. But if there are those of you who are in the habit of donating, uh, you can still do that. There's a bottle redemption center on Putney Road that we use, and there is an account for the interfaith youth. So if you wanted to drop them off there and give us the benefit of that blessing, that would be wonderful. I also hope that you will have seen some of the ways you can give to the Black Lives Matter movement and to Groundworks. Um, and that you continue to make whatever offerings you can. There's also um, <clears throat> the chance to volunteer in Guilford and in town to deliver food. The volunteers are very needed. So whatever you can give in body, mind, or spirit, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Help us weave together a beloved community using every resource we have at hand, whether that be um, offering of money or of time, of talent, of prayer, or just a simple smile when it's mostly needed. Allow us to do that work of blessing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now we have our closing hymn, one for all of us to sing together, Send Me Jesus. 
Tu mamina, tu mamina, tu mamina, tu mamina, so man, tu mamina, tu mamina, tu mamina, tu So our service is at an end. Um, I'm about to offer the benediction, but I'd like to encourage you to find us on the Zoom link for the coffee hour so we can all be together and sing our happy birthdays. Um, God bless you. God keep you. May God's face shine upon you and through you now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.